Welcome back for another uh, hour of Guess What's Wrong With Our Telephones. Anyhow, we've been having an interesting evening talking to people from all walks of life, but gee whiz, poor Shannon, 17 years old, trying to uh, find a survival with a, a sexually aggressive stepfather. Difficult stuff. Who do we have? Okay, we have Jeanette, um, and she's questioning her feelings for women, and I believe she's online too. Jeanette? Can you speak up, Jeanette? Yeah. You really have to, because we're, we're having trouble. Okay. A little bit louder? Yeah. Wonderful. How old are you, Jeanette? I'm 13. And tell me what's going on. Well, I don't really know how to explain it, because, I mean, I was going out with this one guy, and I thought I really liked him, but then I started looking around or something, and I just got this weird feelings, and... I started watching movies, and I don't know, I just feel different now. How do you mean? Well, I mean, it's kind of hard to explain. I mean, I like guys, but then I really don't. I'm more attracted to women, I think, than I am to guys. Um, when you say you're more attracted, tell me what that attraction feels like. I don't know. Um, I just get this feeling that... That I don't know that I'm gay or something. Because, I mean, I can't talk to anybody because I'm afraid they're going to laugh. And I can't tell my mom because I'm afraid she might... I don't know what she's going to do. Well, you, you, the way you, you say that is you say it as if you think you're bad for having those feelings. I do. I mean, whatever feelings you have are feelings you have. And whether they're feelings of hurt or anger or sexual attraction... Whatever you feel are your feelings. Your feelings define you, okay? And, you know, very often when people have a sexual feeling that they feel is forbidden, like a feeling of sex, a sexual feeling to someone of the same uh, sex, they get very scared. That's the way I'm feeling. Okay? Now, it's very common for people who are 13, 12, 14 years old where sexual feelings are just starting, to have sexual feelings about both boys and girls. That's, that's just common, Jeanette. Well, I mean, in a way, it feels like I don't like guys anymore. Well, what was your experience with guys that shut you off? Well, uh, I think it was just because, well, we were just like walking and talking, and I just, I just felt different, I mean, I can talk to my friends about certain stuff, but I can't talk to him, you know? I just feel different when I'm around girls. Okay. Um, and the feeling you have around girls is what? I don't know. I mean, I just uh, feel like I'm all excited and happy and just feels weird. What, why is that weird, to be excited and happy? Because a lot of people... I think that being, because at my school they make fun of people who are lesbos or gay. But you, we don't know that you are. I know that, but... <laughs> we don't know anything right now. All we know is that you're not comfortable around boys, and that's n not terribly atypical. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And instead of labeling yourself one way or the other, maybe, maybe you're just not ready for anything at the moment. Maybe you want the company of women for a while. That's perfectly okay. Some guys never date girls till they're in their 20s. Some girls never, never feel comfortable about being around guys because it scares them. They just don't feel comfortable with the kind of... Uh, male aggressiveness that, that, that goes along with early dating because guys, you know, are, are gropey feely types who are just trying to get something at, at, in the beginning, right? Right. So that it, that makes you feel uh, resentful. And that shuts off all positive feelings because you end up being on, on guard. You know, you go to the movies and a guy's trying to get into your blouse. You may not want that to happen. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And, and, and guys, you know, that they have their targets and and their quota that they have to fill. It's a crazy thing with adolescent boys. Did she let you touch her? You know, that kind of stupid stuff? Mm -hmm. So 
So maybe you're just reacting to the stupid stuff. We don't know. Why don't you give yourself a break and put the, put the decisions back on hold? You can enjoy being with girls. It's exciting to be with them, I think, probably because you feel a lot like yourself. Well, see, I've also been thinking about having a sex change when I grow up. Into what? To a guy? Yeah. When did you start thinking about that? I don't know, about three months ago. And why, what happened three months ago that, that prompted, that prompted you to start thinking of a sex change operation? Well, I mean, yeah, I was just walking down the street with my friend Steve, and then I saw this, I don't know, um, kind of embarrassing to say, but pretty girl, and I don't know, I just got, I just got this queasy feeling in my stomach. Was it fear or attraction? I don't know. It might have been both. See, you've got to sort these feelings out. You want, you want permission to feel whatever you want. Isn't that really what you want? Uh, in a way, I feel like it's, it's like something's taking over. I don't know. What's taking over is repression and inhibition. And I think when you inhibit feelings, that sometimes feelings that are normal start to feel kind of abnormal. Do you know what I'm saying? For instance, if, if, if the sex were not involved in the feeling, and you were just angry, okay? And you were afraid of feeling angry, you'd be afraid of feeling angry everywhere in your life. Do you remember that little talk I, I gave before when the phones were off? Yeah. Did, you, did that relate to you? Not really. But if you'd put sex in the place of anger, it would have, right? Probably. Okay. So most, I, I'll bet, from my experience, that most of what's bothering you is the fact that you can't be open. If you could sit down with your mother and say, gee, I think I'm attracted to, to, to women. I get these strange feelings when I see women. And she would say, well, you know, the truth is, I used to have feelings like that, and I thought I was gay, too. And she said, you'd say, really? And she'd say, really? And you, all of a sudden you say, wow, isn't that interesting? W what would that feel like if your mother said that to you? I really don't know, because you know, my mom... I think she kind of like, um, after she had me, she just never dated anymore or anything, and so I really don't know. So she has some feeling about, about sex, too, that isn't quite right, right? Right. Maybe you should sit down and talk to her about her life and your life and some of the feelings you have. I take it there isn't a dad at home? No. And there never was? No. Okay, so that may be one of the feelings that, that's going wrong, too. I would bring it up with your mother and start talking. Just to have it out on the table so the two of you at least know that you're both talking about the same thing. And give yourself the benefit of the doubt. We don't know what the answer is, so don't you start deciding on your own. And talk to your mom. Okay? And guess what? Everybody has these feelings of confusion about their sexual identity. We have all, in our life, had crushes on members of the same sex. Does that help? I guess. I guess. For what it's worth, I kind of have a crush on you. Okay. Call back again in a couple of weeks. Okay. After you talk to him on. Okay. Okay. This whole thing about sexuality is tough for young kids because they have no experience, nothing to base it on. And, uh, and all these decisions that they want to make. Well, no, they think they have decisions. They don't have decisions. What they're trying to do is find out who they are, and then they can decide. Who's next? Okay, we have Jerry, and um, he's feeling some anger towards his girlfriend. Jerry! Yes. How old are you, Jerry? Forty-nine. What's going on? Uh, my girlfriend of a few months uh, the other night uh, was masturbating, using my penis while I was sleeping does not know that I woke up and I haven't confronted her with it. And my first reaction was a little of, uh, uh, not pleasure, but uh, uh, flattered. You were flattered. But then it turned to anger. Why did it turn to anger? Why didn't you stay flattered? Because... There are a lot of guys who just called in who would have been flattered and stayed flattered the whole night, Jerry. Call had, Robert, for God's sake. Except I had refused sex earlier that night. I wasn't in the mood and didn't want to. Okay. Why, why weren't you in the mood? Uh, 
Well, it's been building up. Uh, she has made demands in the past of a criteria for sex and frequency and so forth. And I just she wants more sex than you do? Not necessarily. It's just that What are the criteria? I love criteria. Give me some criteria. Uh, her criteria was that we should have sex a minimum of three to four times a week. And you don't think that's good? Well, I don't think it's bad. I just think it should be more spontaneous than that, than, than a schedule. Well, uh, she didn't schedule it. She just said three or four times. Yeah. Why does that bother you? Uh, it sets rules. And How many times a week would you like to have sex? Um, I don't think I have a predestined number. No, I'm going to ask you for one, though. Uh, maybe three or four times a week. <laughs> I think I got a girl for you. <laughs> so what bothers me is that she was doing this when I had not wished it. I didn't want to participate. Well, it's kind of unusual, but she certainly has, a, how shall we say, initiative. But I have not confronted her with it, and I don't know if I should or if I, uh, it has really annoyed me. Annoyed you? Yeah, to the point where I'm considering breaking up with her over it. Over that? Well, like a culmination of those things. Dumb. It would be, that would be dumb. I think you ought to talk to her and get it into the open and tell her what was going on. And tell her that you felt hurt. Next time, tell her to wake you up. I felt used. Well, you were used. Do you love her? Uh, I thought I did. Yeah, so, so she... Question it. Oh, well, she uses you and you love her. It's not so bad. You know, this would be a much bigger issue if, it w if you were doing it to her. That's how our society is. Right? Well, in my own mind, I kind of put it in that uh, context that if, if the tables were reversed, it would be rape. Well, I know. The truth is, um, and I don't want to put it down, because the whole, the whole situation, but the truth is, I think what you're, really, what you're really struggling with is her style, her controlling style. Yeah, and I also thought it was somewhat perverted in that she would do something like that knowing I had not wanted to participate. I think Woody Allen said, the only, the only good sex is dirty sex. Well, I have viewed sex kind of in three ways, where you can make love, yeah. you can have sex, yeah. or you can the F word. And if you're in love with someone, you can do all three. Yeah, so what is this? But uh, it seems like a lot of the times that I'm making love, she's the other. You have a you have a very sexual woman there, all right, and she may be too much for you to handle because that kind of woman it happens to have a sexual situation where when they have to have sex, they have to have sex. You know. Okay. This is a woman who demands service, pal. Yeah. Not the worst thing in the world, you know. No. And the point is that she's going to get demanding and she's going to get obsessional because I think she uses sex as a tranquilizer, right? Yeah, I think so. Is it she, could be. Is she polyorgasmic? What does that mean? Multi-orgasm? Oh, oh, I didn't hear you. Uh, I don't know. You don't know? No. No reports from the battlefield? No. <laughs> um, I, it would not surprise me. Okay. But I have not. I, I don't think that I've noticed. How could you not notice? Well, I just. Maybe uh, you ought to turn the I light on. I guess the answer is no. You ought to turn the light on. <laughs> We've done that too. You've done that too. <laughs> oh, well, you're an experimental couple, aren't you? Listen, uh, Jerry, Jerry, I think this is a good thing. And I think what you really are talking about, someone with a much higher sex drive than you who really needs more sex than you do. Um, since you are both in the same ballpark, I'd go along with her. Let her run the scene for a while and see what it feels like and stop making it an issue. Should I confront her with it or just let it go? You know what? Between us guys, be aware the next time that she starts and, and, get a, and next time it happens, turn awake and um, participate and thank her for the wake-up call. All right, but I wasn't, I didn't want to. That's the whole point. Oh, come on. You don't want to. You don't want to. You said spontaneous. 
But you ended up wanting to. Not, not that night. No, I didn't participate that night. You didn't? No. But you, yes, you did. Unknowingly. You absolutely participated. You pretended to be asleep. Did you have an erection? No. But you pretended to be asleep, and you let her do this. Well, I was sleeping. She woke me up. Yeah, but you pretended to stay asleep. Yes. That's that. You were participating in it then, by pretending to be asleep. Well, I was. I was too embarrassed to really say anything. Oh, why were you embarrassed? I, because I, I didn't like what was happening. Uh, I don't buy that. You were taken by surprise. Yes. You kind of liked what was happening and didn't like what was happening. Right. My first reaction, like I said, I was flattered, but I didn't like it. Yeah, the first reaction was flattered. So stay flattered. Jerry, trying to do you a favor. It's the controlling aspect and the compulsive aspect of her that you find difficult. The sexual aspect is, you know, like the circus is in town, right? So, uh... Enjoy the rings. I still don't have an answer. Should I just forget it? Forget it, forget or, it, forget it. discuss it with you. Forget it. This isn't the issue. And it would really embarrass her and turn her off, and it would shut the whole thing off. The fact is that if you knew about it and kept your mouth shut, you were, you, you were complicit. And you were her sex partner. Okay, I'll pretend to be a corpse, and you can do what you want with me. That's a sex game some people play. And you, you have such talent, you were playing it without even knowing it. God bless you, Jerry. All right. Thank you. Hey, Jerry, yes. lighten up. Come on. Thanks. you got to talk to her about her obsessive ways. And if she says three to four times a week's okay, agree to it. Okay. Well, I haven't disagreed with you. Well, of course you haven't, because you're flattered. Yeah. Stay flattered. Remember that. All right. Bye, Jerry. <sighs> I don't know about the moon, but uh, we're right on the edge, right on the cusp. You stay tuned. Very interesting. The L.A. County Children's Services and the L.A. County Crisis Hotline called in, and we put uh, Shannon in touch with them, so help is on the way. It's interesting to see who's watching this, all these people watching. And, um, you know, I could use a letter from you, a card, just a little card, who you are, that you're watching, what you get out of it, what you'd like to hear us talk about. Just like to know who you are. You know who I am. It's nice to know, too, that those people are watching and calling in to help like that, too. See, the nice thing is that, they, that this is becoming a forum for, for, for people reaching out to other mm -hmm. people. Who's next? Okay, we have Steve, and he's in some trouble. Steve. Hello. Steve, what a dark voice. What's the matter? Uh, well, um, I've had a series of spinal surgeries. Uh, it was work-related injury. The doctors had me on medication for a long time. What medication? Uh, everything from Percodan, Vicodin, Vicodin, yes, everything. And? Uh, they decided in their infinite wisdom, I've got irretractable uh, spinal uh, pain, and uh, the problem is, uh, when they cut me off, uh, I was seeking medication anyway, and I called in some prescriptions and got caught. What did you call in? Uh, Vicodin, yes. Vicodin? Yes. Really addicting. Well, the pain is such that um, I really, I can't sleep. I, I don't function. I'm losing my friends. I'm losing touch on reality, really. How much are you taking? Um, five day pills a day. And what were you originally prescribed? Uh, every <clears throat> four hours for pain. So that's s six, six and you're taking probably 50% more, right? Uh, sometimes. So you're... you're when, it's when, it's, when it's not that bad, I don't take But I have pain every day. I've okay. For almost five years. So what's going to happen to you? Uh, I'm... I have to go to court in the near future. And it was a felony, but they broke it down to a misdemeanor. So I'm not really sure what they're going to do. Um, but my... Uh, when, when everything came about, uh, I was... Uh, they were afraid to even incarcerate me at the time. Uh, they said they didn't have the facilities to handle a person in my condition. 
What do they mean by that? Well, uh, with my spinal injuries and everything else, they were they were really afraid to even touch me. Mm-hmm. So, uh, what about the doctors who uh, originally had you on the medication? Are they reconsidering? Uh, no, they uh, they're still a hard line. Um, I had went to a pain doctor, and uh, they were going to put a pump, a uh, morphine grip pump, into my spine, you know, implanted into my abdomen. And the insurance company, the workers' comp, uh, in their infinite wisdom, they uh, decided that they uh, aren't going to do it which I feel is something that might help me and get me back to somewhat reality. So you're in constant pain? Constant. Where is the pain? Uh, well, it's down my whole left side. I've got it, um, my reticulitis runs down my left arm, into my fingers, and down into my left leg. Where was the injury? Uh, in my neck and in my low back. So what, C4, C5? Uh, C5, 6, 6, 7, and L4, 5, L5, this one. Oh, you have a really, uh, on the right side? Left side. Um, tell me about this. What was the accident? Uh, I was in the transportation uh, business, and I was hit by a major company that was on strike five years ago. Okay, and so you, this is five years of this? Yes. Um, well, you... you the main thing is that you you know you'll, you'll you'll probably get through this with a slap on the wrist because um, yeah, I'm scared about the whole thing too, and I, I get really depressed, and I sometimes I think you know, maybe it isn't worth you know. You can well, there are, I, I can understand that chronic pain has a way of making you lose um, your you know your will to live, and uh, there's nothing like having to continuously face something that doesn't resolve. I mean, it just disheartens you. Um, but I think you ought to get to a, 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 a pain clinic. I've been to the pain clinics, and the thing is, until they settle my case or do anything with, with in that way, they, they don't want to pay for it. They're refusing to pay. So the, the doctors, uh, they won't okay the uh, treatment. Well, when is the case going to be settled? Uh, well, it's been almost five years. Your guess is as good as mine. I've been waiting and waiting. Well, the, the dragging on and on, and I feel like I'm in a catch-22 situation. They well, there must, there must, me. there must be someone who who you can go to. Who, well, I've been trying to get hold of my lawyers. I've been trying to get hold of everybody, and I can't get any answers. Nothing. Um. You know, there are there are departments that specialize in pain management. Yeah. And what you need to do is. Um, there must be someone who will talk to you. Will your lawyer talk to you? Well, my lawyers will talk to me, but nobody will okay anything or put the money up front or anything. So the doctors won't do anything because they want the money. If I had the money myself, I would pay for it. Well, you've got to find some way, some way to take care of this. Um, we can't let you just sit there and suffer and, and be driven to uh, getting illegal prescriptions to handle intractable pain. And um, uh, there needs to be, you know, in Swedish society, there's a person who's called an ombudsman. What I would do is I would sit down with your lawyer and, and tell him that you, you must get help with this and that his job is to, is to see that he can shoe you horn, shoehorn you into a clinic. It can be done, but it's going to require your persistence. And I know how hard it is for you, but don't give up. And continues to tr continuously try the tr the pain a different pain clinic, and uh, don't give up if one says no. And you need your lawyer to back you up on this. Um, I wish there be, could be more on that, but you really need to do that. Who's next? Okay, we have Lisa. Um, she was our first call. Uh, her sexual relationship has left her angry. Where is she? She's on line eleven. Lisa. Yes. How are you? Well, okay, I guess. You guess. Why? I'm angry. At whom? This man, this clergyman. Why? Because years ago, it's sort of a long story, but from the time I was an early teenager until my mid-twenties, he encouraged me to have a very over-dependent relationship on him, which ended up sexual, and I was really hurt by it, and his life has just gone on just fine, and now I'm 
newly married and I've always wanted to pursue this and now I feel like I can't because it would hurt me and my husband and pursue. our families and you always wanted to pursue what some sort of action against him because I see I think this is probably against the law I read some article that said that clergymen taking advantage of you know people is similar to psychiatrists taking advantage of their patients and okay so what would you do to go forward I guess I'd have to find a lawyer or something. How long have you been thinking about this? I guess about, this happened in 1986. So, and a lot of bad things happened to me afterward, and a lot of bad things were going on during the time that he took advantage of me. I had uh, very bad problems with um, eating disorders, anorexia, bulimia. I was feeling depressed, suicidal. And he's, he never referred me to get any other kind of help. He told me he was the only one I could trust that all I should do is call him, that he was going to get me through it. And finally, when I was feeling th ready to take my own life because I was nothing but a food and vomiting machine, he said that you know the real, the real problem was that I didn't have anybody to feel close to and have anybody to hold me and touch me and all these things. And it just destroyed me. I was even more destroyed after that. I was in school and I dropped out and I'm still paying over $10,000 of bills. And this man is just sailing along through life. He's going to get a very, he has a very well-paying job as a clergyman. He's going to have a wonderful retirement. He's married. He has children. He has everything. And he took a huge chunk out of my life. I mean, I shouldn't have had to be 13 years old depending on him until I was 25 and have it all end in sex. And it's not fair. And But now I don't know what to say or do because... What does your husband say? What does my husband say? Mm hmm well, he's concerned about me. I mean, yeah, but what does he want to do? He wants me to do what's right, but he knows that reality says that if this thing were brought out into some sort of lawsuit, that we could all be exposed, that our families could be hurt by it. Well, you will be, and you have to take that that into into stride. But I don't know if it's worth destroying. I feel like he destroyed a huge chunk of my life already, and I don't want him to hurt what's coming up in the rest of my life. Get a lawyer. Step one. Tell the lawyer how you feel about it. The lawyer then approaches him. And you, you work towards a settlement. So it can be done out of court. So neither of you go public. I actually called this clergyman and I approached him about this idea. I said, look... It, he, what did he say? He said... Oh, I see you're trying to blackmail me. Well, I don't give in to blackmail. Just take your best shot. And I wasn't trying to blackmail him. I just said to him, look, what you did to me was wrong. It was against the law. And it's not fair. And I think you should talk to me about making some sort of a settlement so that it doesn't have to be pursued to a bigger level. That Get a lawyer. Try the next level. The lawyer. I mean, the, you, you can't do that on your own behalf. He could intimidate you and ch chew you up and spit you out. Just as he did. Okay. Get a lawyer, have the lawyer approach him, and you need a good lawyer. Where do you get somebody that can handle this sort of thing? I don't even know who to turn, who to ask for this kind of... Well, you know, finding a good lawyer um, without getting, in, getting into something inane about that. Um, First of all, you ask your friends if, who, if they've had a good experience with lawyers, who they've used in, in, um, in civil or criminal cases, and um, just ask around who they know is, is, a, good, is a good lawyer, and, uh, and you'll find um, that you'll have more, uh, more input than you know what to deal with. But get a lawyer. Just ask around. There'll be friends of yours who will know and will be able to help you out. Who's next? Want to take another one? Yeah. Okay, we have Pat on line three. Now, Pat's a callback. She had no memory of her childhood, oh, yes. but now she does. Pat. Hi. Hi, Pat. I spoke to you some time ago, you know, like a month ago. I told you that when I was little, um, I have all these dreams that my mother gave us away, uh, me and my other two sisters. Right, I remember this. Okay, well, I did went to talk to my mother. And uh, I didn't get that much from my mother, but I went to my sister. My sister is blocking worse uh, than me. 
She's two years older, but I spoke to her, you know, and we put things together. And what I was suspected was true. She said my mother was doing something that she wasn't too proud. That's why she didn't want to talk to us. So I spoke to my mother. That was Mother's Day. And I say, Mother, you know, I've been on my own since I was 12. I have never asked you for anything. It's Mother's Day, and I know how important it is to you. Well, I want a gift from you. Tell me what happened. But she wasn't really talking. I was pulling words. You know, I said, I remember this and this and this. I was, and I said, how old? And I said that I was three. And she said, well, something like that. Uh, finally, I, well, to make it short, I was two years old when they gave us away. I have two sisters. One, she was a baby. She was probably in diapers when this happened. Um, I don't, my, what I need help from you is like, I don't know how to feel about my mother now. I don't know if I should be angry with my mother, if I should be understanding because I have no feelings. Well, why did she give you away? Uh, my mother was working in a place that she didn't want to talk to us. She was a and prostitute? Yes. Okay, how do you know that? Uh, because my sister, when she was five years old, we found my sister and my sister, uh, my mother married this man when we was like six years old, something like that. And then uh, my sister told me, this is what my sister told me now, and she hears my grandmother, my grandmother uh, telling my mother, uh, you should appreciate that my son took you out of the place where you were. Okay, but the main thing is what you say you don't know what to feel about your mother. Yes, I, it's, it's like no feeling. Well, I mean, you've got to get over the shock. I mean, your mother did the best she could. She wasn't in terrific shape emotionally. She finally married someone to, to get, you, get the whole family together again. And she's just very ashamed of it. The, so the first thing I would do is continue to talk to your mother about how how ashamed your mother must have been to have to keep all these secrets all this time, how ashamed she must have been to hide, and that what you really want is for her to feel comfortable so that you can have a relationship with her that's not guarded. And what I would do is tell her that you accept her, but you're in shock over, over the new reality which you're coming to understand, and maybe the two of you together, by talking about it more and more, can eventually reach a new kind of peace and a new kind of understanding. But it's too early to make a judgment about what you feel. You're going through the shock of what, what is being remembered. So start telling your mother that you know she feels ashamed of it and tell her there's nothing to be ashamed of, that she ended up being your mother, you ended up being her daughter, the family is back together, and now you have to be together in openness. If you can share that, I think you'll get a long way to the whole business of being uh, comfortable about yourself and her presence, and then you'll start remembering a lot more. And the other thing is, when you start remembering a lot more, you become more of a person. The part of your past you forget becomes the future that you're forced to repeat. We all grasp for our past by making the same mistakes over and over again. We'll be right back. Well, welcome back. And we have a full moon, show full moon. Can we see the moon, please? I want the moon. Do we have the moon? Yeah. Here it is. Th that's yeah. the moon that's been driving everybody crazy. Keep your eye on it. Tomorrow it goes into eclipse, and that'll be around 9.30, 10.30, so you want to see that, all you astronomy buffs. Astronomy and psychology, they always have been linked together. Do you know that? I didn't know that. Uh, of course, it's called astrology. Astrology. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> <laughs> okay, wake okay, up, okay. wake up, wake up. All right. Um, we're going to talk with Linda on line 12, and she has some suspicions about her boyfriend and his sister. Linda. Hi. Hi, Linda. Can you speak up, please? Um, I can. I can barely hear you either. Is that better? Okay, Linda. Can you hear me now? A little bit better. Well, I'm not going to yell on this phone, so go ahead. Um... My boyfriend and his sister are, are very, very close. And 
I'm wondering if maybe there isn't something just a little unnatural going on. What are you talking about? Uh, well, for example, if they go out to a party, they hold hands, they never separate, they never talk to anyone else, they whisper in each other's ear, and it's, it just seems somewhat sexual in nature. So, you've inquired, have you? I'm sorry, I've what? Have you inquired of your boyfriend? Like, no, I don't. I, no, I haven't. That's a... Why not? What would keep you from saying, hey, you guys are awfully close? And just to see what his reaction is. You always hold hands with her? Yeah, but it seems like such a serious accusation, and I just didn't know if I was overreacting. Well, you probably are, but they are close. You know what I mean? Yeah. They are close. And you're concerned about it, right? Right. So, how long have you been with him? Uh, about nine months. And has there been anything about your relationship that makes you suspicious that there's something strange? Well, um, ever since she moved to town, our relationship has changed a great deal. How um, do you mean? Which, well, that's the other part of it. I feel left out all of a sudden. Whenever he needs to go out or whenever he has a function to attend, she becomes like his date. And I never get to go anymore. And So that's the issue. Yeah. So raise that issue. The issue is you, you, you feel um, set aside a bit. Has your sexual life changed at all? Um, somewhat, yes. Tell me how. Uh, well, it's less frequent. Uh, and, and when it happens, is it any different? Um, he's been a little bit more distant. Why don't you ask him what's going on? Just say, look, I have some information that I have to run by you. One, our sexual life has become a little more, a little less passionate, a little more distant. I feel uh, we've had decreased frequency, and I also feel that socially I have not been your first choice. So why don't you tell me what's been going on? I think this has started when your sister came in. Please help me understand the relationship between those two, uh, th those series of events and her arrival. Just like that. And then, in other words, not mention anything about the hand-holding or whatever? Well, you, that's yours to mention later on. And I'll say, why, there's absolutely nothing there. I mean, this is all your are And you say, no, no, we don't have sex as often. It's not as passionate. You're kind of distant. And also, uh, you take your sister places that she used to take me. I'm feeling left out. And also, you're very, very close with her. And I, I, I'm just having some strange feelings that because you are the man of the hour in my life, why don't you tell me what's going on and explain this to me? Yeah. It's but open-ended like that. Oh, that's good. Yeah, it's just that three people have mentioned to me the, the way they behave. We understand. Public. We understand. Make it open-ended. Bring the point up and say, please explain to me what's going on and make it make sense. You deserve to know. And after, after all, it is your life. When things go wrong or not to the way you think, and you have a question in your mind about it being correct, the question that comes to your mind is the thing you're supposed to tell the other person. You get that idea. That idea is given to you for you to speak. Speak your question. You deserve an answer. Stay with us. Welcome back. What do you have time for one call? One call. We have Karen on line 11, and she has killed a man in a car accident. Karen. Karen? Is Karen? Okay, Karen is not there. So, so where is Michelle? Okay, Michelle, she is on line 8. Michelle? Yes. Hi, Michelle. Hi, um, I've spoken to you before on your radio station. Um, I'm calling regarding my boyfriend. He, um, 
I met him last year when I was three months pregnant. My baby's father walked out on me and told me to get an abortion, which I don't believe in. I started dating my boyfriend at this time, and um, he stuck with me through the whole pregnancy and stuff like that. was in the delivery room when my daughter was born. I've discovered that he's very heavily into pornography, um, masturbation, um, calling the 976 numbers, and spending two to $300 a month on the phone bill. Um, I'm like your previous caller that the man was complaining about. I'm very sexual and I'm very open-minded. And um, I confronted him with it back in March when he initially moved into the apartment. And um, my daughter is now seven months old. I told him, I said, look, I know what you're doing. I found the porno mag movies in your truck, in your lunchbox. Two of them were half-watched. Um, magazines, I found some sex shop tokens. Um, and I said, I know what you're doing. And I said, your phone bill was really big with your roommate because I think this is what you were doing. He denied it. He says, no, I didn't pay the phone bill in two months. I investigated and I got to the bottom of it. He was calling these 976 numbers, masturbating um, morning and night. I'm a college student and I'm working very hard at getting my degree and raising my daughter. Um, it's been a hardship now because he's moved out. I asked him to leave three weeks ago because I caught him at it again. I actually caught him in the act. Um, at his brother's house when his brother was out of town. His brother's wife had kicked him out of the house in October, canceled the calling card, and wants nothing to do with him. For well, that reason? Um, they don't admit that what, that's why the reason is, but I, I have put together that's what it was. Okay. Um, at this point, I've asked him to leave, and it's become quite a hardship on me emotionally because I didn't realize how emotionally dependent I was on him. Well, also, he rescued you after yeah. you were abandoned. He did. I, I don't have a mother and my father, and it's just I've come from a broken home, and I'm pretty much an island. And he came in, and he was the only one that was in the hospital when the baby was born. Nobody else was there. Um, he says now he wants to keep his own apartment. He wants to let the relationship heal because we were fighting. He says, I was very jealous. I was very insecure. He claimed he was doing speed and alcohol when he was making these calls. And I said, oh, I said, you do drugs too. I says, I can't deal with this. I don't do drugs. I don't even drink. Um, he said he was going to quit when I confronted him in March. And he loved me and he loved the baby and we were his family. Well, I gave him another chance and I caught him again about three weeks ago and I kicked him out. I said, you have to leave. I have a baby. Wait, wait, Linda. Linda, Michelle. Uh-huh. It's over. But I still love him. No, you don't. I mean, I've been going over his house begging him to come back every day. But you him don't I'm love him. Stop begging. Stop asking him to come back. Allow yourself to have the distance you deserve. The guy's into a lot of things that, that are going to make you crazy. He's lied to me quite a bit. Um, wait, wait, wait. Don't you understand that your life focus is about him? I that flunked two of my classes because of him. No, no. You flunked two of your classes because of you. This guy does not belong in your life. He's wrong for you. How do I know he's wrong for you? Because he doesn't make you feel good about yourself. You feel worried all the time that he's doing something wrong. Um, he lies to you. And he's involved in, in stuff and has values that you don't share. What else do you need? Do you think he's closet homosexual? It doesn't make any difference what he is. The, what he is is he's not right for you. The setup that you bring to the relationship is that you are a person who didn't have a close family. And now that you see him in your life, you had the feeling of here's someone who, because he went to the delivery room. Not you're... only that, though, he was there the whole time. I mean, he loved me pregnant or not. Well, the point of the matter is you misinterpreted that. You gave more weight to it than actually should have been given to it. He was there for reasons that had that, that were different than the reasons that you perceived him being there for. What were his reasons for being there? It doesn't make any difference. They don't translate into someone who turns out to be good husband quality, uh, a candidate, and a person who is not especially uh, interested in telling you the truth, and who has a sexual uh, life that's that's secret and that's perverse. What would cause a man to want? Who to cares? Do but it's been driving me But crazy. who cares? It's I can't not... let go until I get to the bottom, until I get to the truth. You think it's you, right? 
not that I think it's me. It's I want to understand it. I've always... It, understanding it isn't going to make you happy. Getting rid of him is going to make you happy. That's just an excuse. You're just afraid of being on your own. That's understandable. He still buys the baby food and formula. He still asks me if we need food. He says he wants to all that work sort of, it out. All that sort of stuff, but he's not willing to work it out. Because he doesn't want to move back in and go to counseling? That's correct. He... The, the, the yardstick that we use to measure the treatability of a perversion, okay, is a very simple one. If the perversion gives gr a great deal of pleasure, it's incurable. Don't waste your time. Do you think he's incurable? What did I just say? That the perversion gives a great deal of pleasure, so it's incurable. But you have a perversion, too. Which is what? When you become desperate mm -hmm. out of your dependency, mm -hmm. you overlook the shortcomings of people and believe that you're in love merely because a person has been there for you. Just because a person is there for you doesn't mean that they're right for you. I've been very self-destructive. Um, I about know. About a week ago, I broke in his house. I wanted to see if there was any pornography in there or girls. Let him thing. go. There's always going to be pornography in his life and there's drugs involved, there's always going to be stuff in there that you can't stand. The time has come to let go of this guy. The sooner you let go of him, the sooner you'll be in touch with yourself, the sooner you'll be free. Arlene, you tell me, does a full moon make it more difficult? Um, I'll get back to you next week. Okay, <laughs> see, no one knows the answer to that, but it some, certainly has something to do with the phone lines. Point is, why should you live a life that doesn't make you happy? Why should you stay with someone who you, you are trying to change? Nobody changes. They just become more of their best or more of their worst. And the truth is, sometimes you just have to cut bait, let the other person go, find yourself, lead your best life. That's what I want you to do. Tell the truth to yourself. Do you like your life? Do you not? If you don't like it, fix it. If you like it, do more of that. See you next week. You may wish to contact the Viscott Center at 1-800-426-4432. The center is open Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. until 5 p.m. Private consultation is available for a fee.